Okay, good afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time you're tuning in the program called What's Going On. Those of you watch those of you who are watching it live will pick it up, of course, at this time at two o'clock in the afternoon. We come on at two o'clock in the afternoon on Mondays. And you only have to put put up with us, with me at least here at the studio, uh one day <laughs> one day a week. <laughs> one hour, one hour, one day a week, and that probably is enough to to keep you uh, charged up hopefully for the rest of the uh, day and week and if not you can tune in some of the programs they have on I hope you're tuning in some of the programs on the uh, conservative networks because uh, they more than ever are needed on the airways because we have all this cluttering of nonsense uh, and I'm talking about people like Joy Reid and some of the others on, on uh, Joy Reid is on I think she's on MSNBC, and I, I get a mixed up because I don't I don't watch MSNBC. If I if I catch anything on there, it's, it's I'm passing by to to get to one of the conservative stations, and I'm caught between uh, uh, Newsmax, that's my favorite, and then I'm going maybe as a secondary source to uh, to Fox, <clears throat> which is way down as as my number two choice. Because after they got rid of uh, Tucker Carson, Tucker Carson, I, I lost a lot of interest in what they were doing, what they're doing over there. I, th I guess uh, you know, I, you know and, and Laura Ingram is, is doing a good job, um, I think. And uh, let's see who else is on there. Uh, I, um, uh, Hannity, Sean Hannity comes on at at nine. And I can tolerate him, but if he keeps on putting these politicians on his program, <clears throat> and he did a um, program last night, you know, they don't like to come in on the, anytime you have a holiday, they have a, a reason not to show up. And they have these uh, substitutes. And then when they are, uh, when they, when they're doing anything themselves during the, during the holidays, they will uh, do a pro, they'll, do a airing of programs they've done and do clips of uh, a number of programs. And last night <clears throat> was an indication of uh, the kind of program that's going to drive me away from that station if they keep doing that. And that was uh, last night they had a snippets of a number of programs. And the first three snippets were, were, were those programs that had uh, politicians on it. And so, the, for the you know, what I do when I see a politician on the air is I uh, bypass uh, that segment. So I just simply, the first 45 minutes of it, I got through that in no time because I kept, you showed me a politician in the air, I'm going to continue to bypass what, what you're talking about because the last thing I want to listen to is a pol politician. <clears throat> I don't consider them to be anything other than knuckleheads. Uh, they don't know anything. <clears throat> and uh, and then, and and nine nine percent of the time, they're not saying anything. <clears throat> so, Mark Levine, your program, <laughs> your program last night, which is on at let's see, come on, eight o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays, and you're off by nine. I think I did that program uh, last night in about eight minutes. And the only segment I watched was that by uh, by Miller, and uh, I paused to listen to what he had to say. But the rest of the rest of it, I don't. You bring on there Tom Cotton and who some of these other politicians they had on there? Unless you have somebody on there like um, uh, David uh, Han uh, David Hanson and some of these thinkers then you can forget my my because i'm only one person but you can forget my viewership i'm trying to learn something and i can't learn anything from these politicians uh, uh what they talk about is so uh mundane and irrelevant i never hear them qu quoting anybody or stating a source <clears throat> for the things they talk about it's just one opinion that's hang hanging out there I don't know what, what it's based on. What is what, is, what the things you're talking about in Washington uh, about the, the legislation you're passing? What is that based on? What what are the ideas 
from which those laws you're passing spring. And who are your progenitors? Who are the people? I want to know who are the people you admire uh, in in our in our in our past. I never hear uh, anything about Madison. I don't hear anything about. I I don't think any of them have respect for George Washington. And I never hear them re referring to uh, the framers. Can I get a little Hamilton in here once in a while? Uh, I mean, I don't agree with a lot of things that Hamilton did and said, but the man was a significant contributor to the ordina ordination that we have right now as we in our country, in which our country operates. So can he get any, any dap up in here? And I I just can't get some sense of feeling of, of where, where these people are coming from. I should, I should like to get into, um, well, not really, but i like to find out what is the thinking behind what uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is talking about because I don't know what the grounding points are. <laughs> I don't know where that is coming from. And, uh, you know, the, squ the, the squad, she's one of the members of what they, what they call the squad, and they had a rally for this one guy out of New York, and they're gonna call a rally. And he's a member of the, he's a perky member of the squad, and he got beat in the primary. And that's what you, that's what I hope they'll do a lot more, more of. I don't think you'll get people out of their, their party uh, link, but at least you can primary them, and, and because if, if you're in a state like New, like like New York, which is a stronghold for the Democratic. Uh, party and they're not going to leave that party anytime soon. So you're going to challenge these incumbents in in New York, and most of them should be primary should be challenged. You're going to challenge them in the in the primary. They have a chance of winning. And this guy can't think of his name um, was primary, and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez ran out on the stage and was bouncing all up and down and exhorting that they ought to vote for him. He lost. And maybe that's a that is a forerunner of that's a uh, that's a foreteller of things to come because a lot of people have got to be if it's gonna take primarying them to get them out of power, then that's what's got to happen. In these uh democratic strongholds a lot of them need to go, need to go, and some of these conservatives need to get out of there too. But in these uh, democratic strongholds, where they Schumer and people like that that have been up there all these years in Washington, what are they doing in Washington all these years? When the uh, attention was to go to Washington, do your work, <clears throat> make your contribution, and go back home, but they don't have any because of the skill level the skill they bring to the table, they're not doing that. And they're not doing that because where are they going to get a job that's paying them $174,000 a year for sitting in a chair uh, talking nonsense? <laughs> I, I don't, you know, it just, it's, we, we've got, to, we've got some work to do here. And some of that work hopefully will start in November, November the 5th. We have, we got, we got to turn some people out. And uh, that's that's got to be done if we're gonna if we're gonna uh, turn this country around. You know, last week I was talking about. I guess I'm talking about it this week as well. Uh, this idea of draining. You know, we talk about draining the swamp, <clears throat> and I don't think we've ever had anybody quantify what we, what we mean by that. The swamp. We think the swamp is. Um, you're going to drain the swamp by maybe electing two or three more people in, in the Congress and send two or three of them home. And you're going to drain the, it takes us a lifetime to drain, drain the swamp at that pace. You see, most people don't understand what a swamp consists of. It's basically a low, de <laughs> low depressed area, which actually the swamp, you know, the DC is actually built upon. It's built up by, you know, but built up by debris. And then uh, the swamp actually itself is comprised of decaying vegetation and animal matter that gives off odors and stuff like that has gases associated with it. And also it's a rich, it's a rich ecosystem, but, 
it's also enriches itself up on the death of other things, okay? And uh, the death of the, which, which creates us, uh, the swamp, in my opinion, is the, the bodies and the lives and the dreams of the American people. Mm -hmm. I think the swamp is a very appropriate, uh, you know, very appropriate label for this, you know? Yeah, if, it's a, if, it, if, this, if, if by the swamp you mean a place that has a lot of debris that is uh, unnecessary for the growth and life that is to take um, its nutrients from the environment and so on. Yeah, I can understand that in terms of you relating that to what's happening in Washington. There's a lot of uh, lot of things in Washington that are just draining the, uh, uh, most of what's happening in, in, in Washington is draining the, uh, the country. There's no, there's no real quote unquote uh, academic anything going on there that we are, we are actually learning things from or gaining anything from. I mean, what are we gonna learn from these people that's in Washington uh, from from the Schumers that have been up there for a lifetime and from Biden. Biden has been there in Washington. This is this, this man has been in Washington for 50 years. Can anybody name anything of any, uh, any concrete thing this man has done in the half century he's been in Washington, D.C.? <clears throat> Running again in, 20 <laughs> in 2024. Uh, somebody need to read my, my post today on Facebook. I write on Facebook every day and I'm, I have to work on shortening what I write because I know people don't have all the time to be sitting there reading what I, what I write. So I may have to make it a little bit shorter than I have to go back and cut it down to a certain size. Uh, this uh, piece I did today was about five, five pages. So I had to cut it down some it's to about four, four and a half. I think five, I think four, even four is, is sometimes too long. But what I'm writing about um, um, on, on Facebook is I'm writing things that nobody else is talking about, but need, but we need to, we need to start talking about these things and bring these things into the mainstream part of our conversation because we've got to understand where, where we are right now with this country. And we are in a very bad place because we're in a place right now where the framers of this country, what they intended, all of that that they had in mind when they said, uh, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America, uh, that which they wrote in the original uh, constitution, in the original document that's made up of the seven articles of the constitution those things they put in place there as a grounding point of how the country is supposed to operate, all of that's been been uh, dismissed, shattered, and thrown thrown away and placed in, according to Napolitano's uh, writing, placed into exile. And that's how you create a swamp, in a sense of how we use that term. Because once you discard the things that this country is based upon, you're creating a swamp. I brought a I brought a book to the studio today that I that I wanted to uh, bring as a backup of what we talked about last week because uh, these things are very controversial that we talk about, but it's not controversial if we understand the in, the intent of what was created in in the uh, constitution and went turned into a constitutional convention in 1787. <clears throat> it was not intended to, to be that based upon the charge that they had gone there with. But I think in the back of their mind, I think they had in the back of their mind that they were gonna go there and and and, and go beyond the uh, the charge of which they, the things they had been charged with. Because they had been charged to go there to revise the Articles of Confederation. But I think in the back of their mind, they had this idea that in order to really do what that which was necessary to put this country on a much more sound uh, legal footing, constitutional footing, uh, you had to almost discard the document. And that's what they did, as a matter of fact. They went there with plans to do that, the Connecticut plan, um, the Albany plan, the, um, the, the Virginia plan, which was the plan really uh, carried there to the to this um, meeting in Philadelphia uh, from the state of, of Virginia, 
of the two um, largest states at this time, which was uh, Virginia and Massachusetts, the most important states at this time. And I think they went there with the idea that they were going to put their ideas on the table as a, as a building block of something that would have done what the articles were supposed to do, but to do it, uh, first of all, to, to do the restrictions that the articles attempted to do without, in fact, cutting off the, the power, power necessary for the government to, in fact, function as a policy that would be able to do the things governments are supposed to do. Number one, protect the, the sovereignty of the country. And then of course, number two, to protect the liberty and the, and the freedom of its, uh, of its citizens. Not necessarily in that order, but you must have the sovereignty on the table because without the sovereignty, everything else in fact falls off the table and you have to have a sovereign nation. Otherwise, if you cannot defend the nation's uh, sovereignty, as you're not doing right now, really, you don't even have a country right now because a, a nation must have the, must have sovereignty to uh, even be, be uh, described as a nation. So and you, you know what's really and, weird? And we're not a sovereign nation right now. You know what's really weird is like uh, if I was to go to uh, Mexico without documentation, mm. they'd put me in prison. They want right. to welcome me and give me a phone and um, a bridge card and stuff like that. I mean, and I, I'm so tired of the racist charge. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure a lot of Mexicans and blacks and Asians who live here don't really want other people here drawing. And so they, they also realize the, the security risk, the health risk. I mean, we got people walking through here that have diseases we've largely eliminated. We're not prepared to deal with. And some of them are disease, you know, resistant to uh, treatment which means they're more difficult to eradicate if they're even sometimes they might not be eradicable, you know? So, I mean, why is that so concerned about the people who live here? Why is that so racist to consider that? And that's what the general leftist uh, objection is. You're just being racist. Yeah, I think, I think waste a lot of time, you know, defending against that charge. We waste, we, people have spent a lot of time trying to convince uh, uh, their accusers that they're not racist. And that's a that's a waste of time because it's it's as if people do. Uh, pe the question is, um, what what power? Let's say people do not like a, a certain group of people um, because of whatever the the reasons are. Okay, what is it? What's that? What is the power they have to do anything about it? The only uh, racism <clears throat> that's ever been excellent in this country has been racism backed up by government power. I mean, what happened? What made the uh, the Klan? What what ended the the Klan riding in these neighborhoods? What what ended that? First of all, what created the, what created the uh, the, the Klan? And you need, you need to go back and, and read about the founding of it in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1865. But what created it? What licensed it? What licensed the, uh, the Klan? And, and, what, and what, in fact, led to the demise of, of the Klan? Anybody ever ask that question about uh, why, what, why, why is, did the Klan that began to spread into northern areas, Indiana, for example, what led to the demise of the Klan? I'll tell you what led to the demise of the Klan. Since it was a, a political organization of the military arm, um, a hidden military arm of, Dem of the Democratic Party, what, what led to the demise of the Klan is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's one thing to, to, to have a paramilitary wing based upon the fact that there's a certain segment of the population that has been disenfranchised, but when that population is not disenfranchised, then that hurts the politician because now they got a voice and who is going into office and who's going to stay on the sideline. And when they had the voting rights passed in 65, what happened to the Klan at that point? And ask yourself the question, why did the Klan go into a state of recidivism at, at that point? Why, why, why is there a uh, commensurate uh, rise and decline 
on the one hand, the rise in the voting, the voting roles, roles of blacks, and on the other hand, the decline of the power, quote unquote, of people like George Wallace and Eugene Bull Connor and Ross Barnett and and go and 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 uh, Orvis uh, in. Um, Let's see, Orvis was in, was he in, in, I think he was in Georgia. Uh, Orvis, uh, I think it was Georgia or, or, uh, or Arkansas, one of those two. You know what, I'm just thinking, though, the irony of uh, the clan being formed in Pulaski, Tennessee, a town named after a Lithuanian, a Polish and Lithuanian general of, this, of the, during the revolutionary period, mm -hmm. who was a Catholic. Because uh, the that was one of the things they hated too. The uh, the uh, clan was. Uh, I just want to insert that in there. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, the the whole the the clan was a a WAPS um, group. Um, white. It's W A S P. They usually uh, title it. It was a, a WAPS uh, organization. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So the Jews were excluded. And. Of course, blacks were would be excluded, but the exclusion has no power. You you really can't. You really cannot hurt a group just because you are just because you have a certain um, dislike of, of that of that group. For example, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of people in the South. I'm from the South, so I, I, I live this. So I, I kind of knew it from having gone through it. I, I ran into very few, very, very few in the Bull Connor days of races in, in the South. Now, nobody's going to refute advantage that's given to you because of certain things that have advantaged you over someone else. So whites would have been uh, foolish to not take advantage of things that were handed to them by politicians because um, they based on whatever it was based upon and so on and so forth. But in those same homes, those same places, I, I would go into, you know, I, I went around and bust, we used to have, uh, have coal as a heating source, he's grinding and, and bust coal that would be out in the yard of people's homes and uh, bust the coal for them and make me a quarter or a dime or whatever I wanted, you know, just some cookie money. And after I would get through working out there in the yard, they would invite me into the, into the home for a glass of water, maybe some lemonade. I'm in their, I'm in their kitchen. This is Bull Connor days. I'm in their kitchen. Uh, 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 drinking lemonade out of a glass, and they did throw the glass away when I left out. They, went, they put it in the dishwasher. They, they wash the we didn't have dishwashers. You put the uh, glass in the sink with the other dishes and, and wash it out as you wash the dishes out that drank by, out of by anyone else. I didn't. They, I didn't. Hear, I didn't feel like I, I go in there and I wouldn't come out alive. So this, I, but but in terms of. Um, of, of the advantages that were accruing to to whites in the South at that time, under George Wallace and and uh, under Bull Connor, that's as real as as, as rain. But it, but but what caused Bull Connor and George Wallace to to sound the way they were sounding out in public? The fact that they had disenfranchised the blacks, they couldn't say anything about it. And then the whites getting advantages because of the way they're being treated. One one example was that um, I was I was raised on 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 welfare. Now the welfare in that time period was very different at that time than it is right now, because the, the welfare was for the for the working poor. I mean, nobody was giving you a check. You had to still pay your bills, so you had you had to still work. And so what what was happening with the welfare is that your Money, your 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 job. My mom worked as a domestic, 
you could, I could see my mom in this film called The Help, which I I didn't even know what my mom, I knew my mom worked across town as a, as a domestic. My mom never talked about her job. She went over there and made her money and came back home in the community we were in, in the segregated community, because we, we lived in uh, this community, part of the community, and White lived around, across, around uh, down the street and around the corner. We all live in the same neighborhood, but just not in the same, and not in the same block. And I, I, I knew my mom worked as a domestic, but she went, she went across town and worked. And uh, she worked in, in being a domestic. She worked in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in white homes. And when she came back, she never talked about her job. It wasn't until I saw the help that I saw I, that I realized what my my mom was doing. And I think I cried throughout that movie because I saw what my mom went through. But the reason why my mom never discussed her job, and certainly I don't talk about the ones that employed her. Uh, there was one thing in that film that I knew could not have happened because that I won't tell you what that segment was in that film, but that could not have happened. Uh, the help was a, a, from a novel written by a, a white author, but that what they had those that 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 one girl, one woman in that film do to her employer that that would not have happened <clears throat> because the way they looked for their jobs was that this job paid allowed them to put shoes in their, on the children's feet, and they were not going to go uh, and work and then come across back home and then talk about the employer because they looked at them as a, as the employer as someone empowered them to put food on their table and the minimum opportunities they had. They were too appreciative of the jobs that allowed them to do little things they could do. And that squeezed the uh, environment they were in that they just didn't discuss it. it it's, what you, it's what they did. And none of them ever talked about it. Not They didn't talk down. I never heard them talk about um, the cross town things. I didn't, know, I didn't know what that was about. I knew about it. Well, I, from a not, lot of different, I mean, I would call my mom sometimes <clears throat> um, on her job, and um, I would if I had something happened in school, I would call my mom, and uh, I, would, I remember calling her one time and telling her I didn't want to go to that school anymore <clears throat> because the teacher hit my brother in a drill and hit him upside his head, and I I became hysterical, and I said I in the classroom, I can't go, I'm not coming to school anymore. And I called my mom up and <laughs> I think I thought I just quit <laughs> and go somewhere else. <laughs> so I called my mom about that. My mom was but that best that that's how but my my mom the, the teacher as a matter of in fact there's Miss Slaughter's class and she told the student, oh he'll be here tomorrow. I'm saying to myself, no way. But my mom Talk some sense to me and so on and so forth. And I was back there. Yeah, I was back there the next day. My mom never talked about her job. And my mom was too proud of the fact that that job that she went to every day, my mom never took a sick day. And she never came back and said so and so and so and so. I, it was just never discussed. That was the job she had. Now, you know what we do today? Everybody's talking about their the, the, where they work, who their boss is, and who they don't like. I, I never heard that. <laughs> I never heard that conversation. And my mom, I, my, I comment my mom's behavior. That's why when I retired, I had so many sick days saved, saved up because I had learned from my mom to go to work. So look, all this stuff about segregation and uh, racism, racism on the lips of everybody in this country today. All they talk about is racism. Somebody says something that somebody doesn't like. And uh, there's a thing right now in um, Louisiana, somebody, I think it was in, it was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, they they wanted to uh, the schools in 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 Louisiana in that part of Louisiana are bad, and the people uh, weren't allowed to set up a school for their children to give the children a better education. Or the tearing up the classroom and some other places for sending their children. 
So they decided what they're going to do is set up a, 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 another township so as to carve that out as their own township and then set the school up in that township. They're not telling people they can't um, come in there. But then on the one hand, people are saying we could do without the whites and there would be a better place. And then when they leave, they want to call them racist. Well, the question is, is, is uh, in this time period, in the post-1965 time period, what, is, what does racism have to do with anything as an impediment is holding anybody back? Because the politicians are not going to say anything uh, today because the fact is that uh, they're going to try to accommodate those groups because those groups have been empowered now by doing what King was talking about before he started hollering about a dream that he had in 1963. Well, the, the dream was not even um, um, didn't it, it, just a lot of inspirational uh, uh, talk that didn't have any content to it. <clears throat> There's no content in that speech. The contact, the con, the, uh, uh, the 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 speech that he gave that had substance was a speech he gave in 1957, three years after the Brown ruling, where King was saying, give us a ballot. One of them said it six times, give us the ballot. And then he said, and, we, and the last time he said it, and we would not need the federal government. And you don't need the federal government, certainly not in the condition it's in right now, because the federal government is, because when I say the swamp, when I'm saying the swamp, I'm talking about the federal government. That's a swamp. That's what the swamp is. All three branches of the federal government, including the Supreme Court. That's the point I was making last week. I don't know if I had the clarity I should have had last week. That's what I was saying last week. I was uh, making a criticism of um, of this 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 revered, supposedly iconic figure on the court at the turn of the 20th century. Oliver Wendell Holmes. And everybody's been laudatory about Holmes. And I'm the crazy one here. Uh, I'm saying that not so fast. And when I studied, I said, I know these court cases, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I just cannot go with uh, these court cases if they assume some authority over what's written in the Constitution. I can't go with Holmes when Holmes is talking about exercising uh, free speech um, in certain situations cannot be allowed because it, it creates a, a, a clear and present danger. I can't go with that. Not when I know what the Constitution says. Let me, let me, read, let me read this to you. Here's, here's, here's the language uh, here. In the, uh, in the in the amendment, everybody wants to talk about the Constitution and then dismiss it after talking about it. I don't think we can do that and have a have a a, a good outcome. Uh, in fact, one of the things that there was I was saying last week is that uh, uh, this this uh, Joe Pag was saying that the court. Has made uh, has, has has made the ruling that if has an objection to the, um, uh, the uh, these these uh, parts of the federal government created under the executive branch branch of the government that if something is very vague, the idea was then if it's vague, then the institution under which that particular uh, provision falls, they have the right to to decide what it means. Of course, the court's not going to tolerate that because the, the interpretive role of the government is the court uh, the, the court case. Here's my objection uh, uh, to to that. My objection, and I was trying to say that say this last week. My objection to it is that the the gov the federal government has a tendency to throw a stone and hide his hand and the role it plays. It claims that the, the law is not specific enough, yet when the, yet the, the, the lack of the specificity 
of the law's enforcement. In other words, treating the law, the Constitution, as if it does not speak in the terms in which it speaks. And then when they create something away from it, where they're saying things that take away from uh, the specifics, and they create this monstrosity as a result of it, then they want to criticize that there's a body being created where uh, the language is, is wide enough to drive a bus through it because it doesn't speak with the specificity. Well, the Constitution speaks in absolute specificity in everything it says. That's how corruption occurs. So That's thinking, how corruption occurs. Because, see, um, you, I was looking, reflecting on what you talked about, you know, brought up Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, basically, <laughs> corruption doesn't necessarily mean payoff and, uh, right. you know, favoritism. It is basically a simple fact that people who, uh, the general populations here back in the 1900s, they heard something from Oliver Wendell Holmes, all medic, they're, they're, all medic, they're sat there in awe of him speaking. And they accepted the what he said because he was considered the expert. And that's what it basically is the uh, color of law, the color of authority that these people, that, that goes a long way in creating corruption in a society because people don't challenge the assertions of people in power because they assume that one, because the people in power are saying this, it's accurate, true, or can't be tested or, or turned around. And I would always say, you know, I was always taught that any, any law that it's abhorrent to the Constitution is invalid. Well, we got thousands of laws across the nation on books that are very, very based upon that premise. I mean, very ba based upon being very abhorrent to our constitution. We have permitted far too much. Maybe we should have mm -hmm. people. I, I remember, I remember rolling my eyes when I heard about people doing, doing passing a law and then they that both sides actually have a test case and they're going to try it in court. And I want, that's kind of ridiculous when I was younger. But as I got older, I could see, you know, that is probably, that's where the rubber meets the road at. It should see if it could pass the sniff test and the legal test. <clears throat> and we've permitted, that's another thing is it's not, always corruption like payola it's basically people are not they're not uh, resolved enough to actually keep their liberties or too willing to acquiesce to people they perceive as authority figures yeah john you're making a, a good point and we have got to get to get an understanding of what the intent was of, of why we have why they decided to throw out number one this is the first thing throughout the articles of confederation they didn't have any problem with what the articles intended to do, but they found out that it could not be done in the way in which it was being done under the articles. The articles were trying to rest restrict government power by not allowing the government to do anything. And that's why they only had the, um, the legislative branch. They didn't have a, a, a judicial branch in the um, in the articles, and they have did not have an executive branch, had a single branch of government. Government was unicameral in terms of the 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 the, the, the three. There was no three branches. The, what I what I credit the framers for is the brilliance of, of their understanding the nature of the problem and having the wherewithal to import a solution to it. If you're going to have one branch of government and tie it down where it cannot act unless it acts with unanimity, because each of the 13 politics have their sovereignty and have to buy into it in order for them to have um, uh, any allegiance to that which is being ordained by the law, if they don't all agree to it, then it cannot happen because they have to have unanimity in the verdict. Well, that has a chance of working, of course, how often is that going to work? Zero number of times. Because you, you cannot get 100% of um, on, on any anything uh, hardly uh, because you got too much divergent interest involved in it. So that doesn't work. But I can understand the, 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 the intent here. The intent is restrain government power. Having come from underneath it, not being restrained in their which they fought against, they're not going to turn around and then give licensed government to have the kind of power that it had when they fought seven years to get away from that power. So they're trying to, they, and so the first thing was just not to relinquish the power to the uh, government or to, uh, to say that all addendums to that which is agreed upon in the articles must have unanimous verdict in order to amend the the articles of confederation that's why there's only 30, 13 articles in it 
because it, because in many it was it was impossible. <laughs> try to try to try to get uh, today an amendment in the Constitution where it you could you have to have a unanimous agreement to ratify an amendment. Let's let's say you let's try to get everybody to agree upon the proposal. You know, you have to have two thirds of the uh, people in the House and the, and two thirds in the Senate to propose uh, an amendment. Now, to ratify it, you have to have three fourths of the states, which is the way we've uh, ratified and added every one of the amendments in the Constitution, except Amendment uh, Amendment uh, uh, Twenty One. Because the 18th Amendment deals with um, prohibition, and the members of the Senate and members of the of the House were too gun shy to um, to repeal it. To which then you are endorsing um, something that's that's anti prohibition, and they didn't want their name on that, so they ratified that amendment differently than, than, than they did the other 26. <clears throat> but all the other amendments were amended by having it proposed by two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, and then ratified by three-fourths of the states, except that particular one. The 21st Amendment was, was uh, ratified in a different different way. <clears throat> the ending of, of prohibition was, um, was, was, was handled in a, in a different way. But to get, uh, get unanimity where everyone, all the states got to agree, that is, uh, that is an impossibility. So it's, it's very difficult to get Three fourths of the states to uh, ratify an amendment, and from 1804, 1804 is when you had the Twelfth Amendment that was um, that was ratified. You didn't have another amendment added to the Constitution until 1865. That's uh, 61 years later. So the Twelfth Amendment was was ratified in 18. Don't tell me 1804. And then from 1804 to 1865, when you have the 13th Amendment, that's a that's a uh, a 61-year period of time before another amendment was added to the Constitution. And then in the ni early 1900s, there was like a rash of them just being thrown in there, wasn't there? Like there was passed left and right. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, the the uh, but the reason why you have a a, a rash of amendments passed in uh, in 13, the 13th Amendment in 1865, and then the 14th Amendment in 1868, and the 15th Amendment in 1870, the reason why you have a, a rash of those amendments was because of the, um, the fact that you had certain states that were outside of the, of, the, of, the, of the Union. In order to come back into the Union, they had to then ratify in, in these three cases right here, they ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So that ratification would happen because there's a gun that you're using uh, for the uh, for the rat ratification. Uh, the there there are some amendments. I will say this, and and I know scholars are not going to go along with me on this, but I will tell the scholars that there are certain amendments that are added to the Constitution that some of them were not actually were, were not actually ratified. The claim is that they were ratified by having a three fourths of the states. I'm I'm am I'm, I'm certain of that. Where they claim that the number of states that they had on record that would have ratified, I won't tell you which one they are because then you'll start to get yourselves in trouble because. <laughs> But I, I can tell you one. I, one, well, one of them in particular was not was not ratified. It was a claim they were ratified by the uh, number of states that were, that were needed. But there are certain things that were added to the Constitution even beyond that point that were added to the Constitution that are that are not that that are unconstitutionally added to, to the document. But, um, the Seventeenth Amendment is definitely unconstitutional. 
which is the one about the um, election of the senators. <clears throat> that is that is unconstitutional because the Constitution um, requires a uh, Republican form of government, and this popular election of the um, of the senators was intended to be elected by the states, one body for the mem for the people and one body for the states. And so the House body, House Representatives, is exactly what it says in the title of it, the House of Representatives, the representatives of the people. Both of them are representatives, but representatives of different constituencies. The other representative body, the Senate, is a representative body also, the representatives in the Senate, but those representatives were intended to be representatives of the states. And that would be the state legislatures we send them to the uh, to the Senate as the watchdogs and the guardians of the state's rights, and they're sitting there in Washington, overseeing the rights of the states, so the government would not overstep the federal boundaries, would not violate federalism. Was it was the purpose of that? And by having the state. Um, representatives elected by the popular vote, that is a travesty that occurred in 1913 when they added that to the Constitution. And I'm saying here, um, I know the scholar's not going to go along with me on this because it's added to the document, but that is, that is an unconstitutional addition to the, to the document because the popular election of the, uh, of the senators is, was, not to be, uh, was not to be allowed it was a, the state legislatures that were appointing the senators to go there and represent the states in that body and make it a popular um, election of the senators took away the state's power to hold the federal government in check because of the fact of what is spelled out in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Now, you scholars are not going to go along with me on that. But you, I'll just ask people this. Look at the passing where they allow for personal income tax to be got, collected from the U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. Then look where they ensued. The First World War, the, the Great uh, the Great Depression, ultimately to the Second World War. The more they increased, the way they did, they, they also added to what you just said about, you know, basically they took away the state's power to hold the federal government in check. That's what they did. They accelerated the rate of uh, the increased the amount of uh, you know confrontations we're in, a uh, very costly confrontations, both human costs as well as financial cost, and they accelerated a basically a, a process of like uh, global globalization. That's what they did. They're behind, and that's what our founders wanted to avoid. They, they wanted to avoid a, a tournament of you know alliances with you know political alliances. Washington's famous you know, farewell address. I mean, they just eradicated everything the whole country is held. That's the danger we're in right now. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are going to have to return to the source. And if we do not do that, and I mean that to do that in a hurry, we don't have a lot more time here before this experiment is, is lost. So, ready to go? I'm ready. And we are. Uh, yeah, it's just three. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not okay. Oh, go on. Okay, go on. Go on. Okay. Um, and we got cut, cut off for a minute here, and we're back live to uh, finish up the program. I was saying here that, um, you know, we have to go back and look at a lot of things that happened in our history and have some appreciation for the grounding point upon which this nation was in fact established. I'm from the South. I'm a proud member of that community I was raised in in Birmingham, Alabama, coming out of that part of the um, state when Bull Connor was the um, police commissioner and uh, George Wallace was the governor of, um, of Alabama at that time. He had been elected in uh, 1950, uh, uh, let's see, 58, let's see, Patterson, and then there was uh, there was Wallace. 
and they were both um, staunch segregationists, but I was um, living around the corner, you know, whites live around the corner, and we were living in a segregated environment because the politicians were benefiting from the fact that they get people to vote for them for saying segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Uh, that is a, it's a political uh, win to advantage a certain group and then have the other group silenced politically. So that's what they were doing in the South. I don't spend a lot of time talking about racism and um, um, war is me and all, all this stuff you hear today is uh, is inconsequential because it's not backed up by the state. They can have all the anger in the world. The question can what, what, what can they do other than create an opportunity for you? Because if they don't serve you in this place and they don't treat you a certain way, then all you do is what, what blacks did at that time. They set up their own businesses and they had a place they would go to, taking money out of the, uh, the coffers of the other person so the segregation was a punishment. The person that were practicing were, were, were benefiting the group that they were discriminating against were being benefited by it because they were setting up their own businesses, setting up their own establishments. My community was full of, uh, of black businesses and we weren't trying to go across town into that except the work and things like that. We were, and they had, they had their they establishment, we had ours. Uh, so I'm making I'm making a, a number of points here. I'm making that point, but I'm also making this point about uh, what the Constitution uh, uh, re requires, and it it requires really an absolute allegiance to what the what the words in the document say. There's no wiggle room in the uh, in the document because the framers are speaking in a voice to restrain a government. It could not say maybe or uh but i didn't count how many times but is in the uh, original document but it's not i, I can't rem remember a single time where it was actually commanding something i think but is in the in the 10th amendment but that's uh that's because it, the 10th, 10th amendment is doing something very different but it it never used the word that word was laying out certain parameters of government behavior. It never says government shall make no law that abridges the freedom of speech, but it doesn't do that. Uh, in Amendment 1, it says this, for example, this is what I was trying to quote last week. Congress shall make no law respecting, and I'm going to skip over some words here to get to, to, the, to the meat of it. Congress shall make no law prohibiting, let's say prohibiting here, prohibiting the free exercise of speech. There's no but in there anywhere. When I see the word but in anything that um, they rule by the court, that but tells me right there that there's, I'm speaking like sojourner truth now because there's a, there's a, there's, she said there's an ornament, there's a fly in the ornament, there's a fly in the Constitution, she was saying. And that but in there, like separate but equal, that's, that's a problem. <clears throat> because equal does not have any but in it when it commands equality to exist. So that but in there is, a, is, is put in there by, by the court <clears throat> that refuses to have the constrained uh, vision. That's what I was trying to say last week. It, it, the, the, the Constitution speaks in, the, in a constrained uh, voice. So the, the amendments are telling the government what it cannot do. The government cannot restrain speech. Now, now, they come behind and say, well, if the speech is creating clear and present danger, well, it doesn't create a, a clear and, 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 and present danger in the marketplace of ideas because better ideas will, 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 will argue their position down. If you have a, 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 a reason, the, the, let's say the draft, the draft, if you have in World War I, first of all, the problem is, is Wilson had promised to keep us out of a war. And then after they vote Wilson in there, we end the war and people object to that because they voted 
for Wilson under false uh, terms, and they're now objecting to it. Now they can't complain about uh, going to war when they voted not to go to war. <laughs> and so now we got this wiggle room stuff. But, well, okay, they say, well, the way you're going to justify that is uh, we're going to say you can't screen fire in a crowded theater. Therefore, you can, since you can't do that, you can't, there's some restraints upon speech. Well, you cannot read the Constitution in the theater either. Because the people went in that theater to, to watch a watch a film or watch a movie or, or watch uh, opera, hear uh, rap artists, whatever. They went there to do something very different. And when they got there, something else happened and that wasn't supposed to happen. Therefore, that can't be allowed. That's not a speech issue. If it, it's about clear and present danger and therefore you can restrict speech, you can't get up in the middle of that uh, movie theater or that concert and start uh, reciting the preamble to the Constitution. I mean, that's speech. And I would say this also, uh, as, as what you can't do. You cannot then extrapolate that the requirement of no infringement on speech will allow you to burn the flag of the United States. I know that's, they're claiming that's also speech. Well, I'm going to tell you this. You're not burning no flag, no American flag, based upon the Constitution because it's not allowed. Now, people say, well, it's freedom of speech. Well, no. The speech is what you say while you're burning it. If you if you burn the flag and say that George Moss, blah, blah, everything you said is, is preempted from, from uh, retribution by the First Amendment. But burning that flag that they're saying you can do under the terms of the First Amendment, they made that up. The flag is the embodiment of the sovereignty of the nation. And you can make all kinds of, of verbal claims of, of, against it because of your First Amendment rights. Anything you say while you're burning that flag cannot be held against you by the fact that it says here, Congress shall not uh, pass a, a law that abridges the freedom of speech. So anything you say while burning the flag is protected by the First Amendment. There's nothing in here that says that you can burn the American flag as a right to do that, which would be to emulate, figuratively speaking, emulate the country, because the flag represents the, 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 the country, that you have a right to emulate that under the terms of speech. The speech is not the burning of the flag. The speech is what you say while you're burning it. All of that is, is protected. You cannot abridge that. Uh, let me make another point here. You cannot do what the court is doing right now. You cannot say, as the court did last week, say that the, the president has, here's what the court did, this wiggle room stuff. The president has limited immunity based upon he has immunity for doing the things that are in the purview and necessary for the for, for the requirement of doing his job as president. So here comes uh, Sonia Sotomayor doing the same thing that Wendell Holmes did in the Schenck case in 1919, making some very outlandish claim so as to make it appear that uh, the immunity uh, claim of the president uh, has no, no, no standing <clears throat> for the reason that, well, did the president have immunity if he orders the um, CL Team 6 to go and assassinate somebody and block, does he have immunity in, in that? So now you got this wiggle room stuff going on again. 
the president of the United States does not have, there's, there's no such thing as executive privilege and there's no such thing as presidential immunity. Now they can make that up, but you see the problem they've created because they made it up. The immunity is not mentioned in the constitution. The word immunity is not there. So they, here, here they're doing it, uh, here, here they're doing it again to the framers. They're saying that there can be immunity in this case. Who's going to determine where the line of immunity uh, is and where it is not? Well, the court's going to decide that, right? They're going to decide this is immune and create all this wiggle room stuff that goes on when there's no immunity. There is no presidential immunity. What you have here that restricts the president from going out of control, what you have here is a separation of powers. You don't have to go into debt in a minute of things uh, that the framers did not uh, uh, foresee. They, they separate the powers so as to, uh, to keep government from going out of, out of power. And they did it by placing in there Article one, section, Article one, section two, clause five. That's the impeachment clause. You see, what what we're not getting here is that the president doesn't have any immunity, but there are protections for them doing what. I guess the president, what they're doing right now, because if you're going to take a charge against the president, what he did in office, you have to begin to, you cannot let him slide and then bam, when he leaves office, get him. Because if you have some claim against the president, you must make that claim against the president while he's in office doing the damage that he's doing. That's the reason why they put article one, section three, clause seven in the constitution. If you don't take an action against the president while he's in office through the impeachment process and it was not egregious enough for you to take him to task while he's president, you cannot say, oh, I'm I'm upset about it now after he leaves office. You can't do that. They cannot do That's why they can't do to Trump what they're doing to Trump right now. You cannot do that because you do not, you do not bring a charge and then convict him on the charge while he's president. And Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7 does not allow you to do what they're doing right now to Donald Trump. That's all unconstitutional behavior. And you don't have to talk about immunity to bring that about. There is no immunity. The court is wrong in that in that, in that that uh, case. And they're wrong in terms of what, what um, Oliver Wendell Holmes did. And has anybody said that Oliver Wendell Holmes repudiated his own judgment the same year in another court case? I'm going to read this to you and then we're going to get off the air. In Abrams versus United States, this, this is another court case that happened in 1919, the same year as Schenck versus United States. Here's what the Schenck case did. Abrams versus United States was a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States upholding the criminal arrest of several defendants under the Sedition Act of 1918, which was an amendment to the Espionage Act of, seven, of 1917, the law made it a criminal offense to criticize the production of war material with intent to hinder the progress of American military efforts. The defendants had been arrested in 1919 for printing and distributing anti-war leaflets in New York City after their conviction under the Sedition Act, the appeal on free speech grounds. The Supreme Court upheld their convictions under the clear and present danger standards set by Oliver Wendell Holmes, by the way, which allowed the suppression of certain types of speech in the public in the public interest. But guess who's the one to object to it in this case? The, the ruling is best known for its dissent by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Wendell Holmes has changed his mind in the Abram uh, case. 
The clear and present danger standard used in this ruling to uphold the criminal convictions fell out of favor. Listen to this very carefully. Fell out of favor and was largely overturned by the Supreme Court in 1969. Now, what is allowing the court to change its mind, to have one opinion set at a certain time, and then later on, the court has another opinion, in this case right here, where, where Schenck was overthrown almost entirely in 1969, why, why did that happen? Different judges on the court. The language in the Constitution did not change. The members on the court changed. And that's what you have when you have people making judgments away from, from, the, from the document. In Blessed, in Blessed versus Ferguson, 1896, where the court said separate but equal, but is not in the equality um, um, uh, docu document in the uh, Constitution, in the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. The but is put there by the court. The Fourteenth Amendment is passed in 1870. Separate but equal is 26, year, is 26 years later in 1896. The court put the but in there. That but separate but equal. There's no but in the in the language. They put that in there, and when they struck it down 58 years later, and said separate but equal is unconstitutional, is an, another is another part is another court m members on the court are, are changed. Now they changed their mind, but the language is not changed in the, in, in the constitution at that point. It's the members of the court have changed, and you, and that's what's going to happen. When you get away from the requirements in the document, and that's the things that we've, we've had here, you create rigor room when you get away from the document, and they're not—they're not actually using the document as a grounding point. I would ask uh, Clarence Thomas. I read his um, a ruling in the um, change they just made. What what part of the Constitution you you you? They say you are an, uh, an originalist. What, what language in the Constitution were you quoting in your writing your own opinion in this recent uh, case? What what part of the document are you quoting? And I notice they never go to a, to a part of the Constitution say that based upon upon this. Uh, where I think you have to go and if you if you're going to make a ruling, you have to show where is that ruling founded in the document that you are interpreting because if it's not found in a document, the court is prohibited from, 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 from ruling on it based upon what is happenstance. They feel this way. Another court comes about later on and feel a different way and make another ruling that's contrary to ruling was made by an earlier court. And that's why you have this, this jumping around that they're doing because they don't, it, it because the court does not take, the founders seriously in, the, in this country. Let me say that and get off the air. The, the, the Constitution, the founders put a document in place. We've got to respect the work that they did and use that as a grounding point of what we're doing right now in this country and get away from all this extraneous stuff that's going on right now because it has nothing to do with what was, intention, what was intended by the framers of the United States. And until we understand that, you're not going to be able to correct the problem that we have created for ourselves right now in this country. That's why this country is so much off the mark right now. Okay, that's a little disjointed, but that's what I wanted to say today. And I want you to also take this book by Mark Levine and read this book, because this book right here says it all. Men in Black, How the Supreme Court is Destroying America. How it is destroying America. Because the court, and I hate to say this, but this is true. The court, the Supreme Court is part of the swamp in Washington. Okay, let me get out of here. See you next week. Until you next week, I want you to follow your dream. If you don't follow your dream, you never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.